This is the story of Ibrahim Babangida, the Nigerian military ruler who came to power in 1985 after deposing the regime of General Mohamedou Buhari in a coup d'etat. When he assumed office, Babangida outlined a number of actions and policies to eliminate corruption, solve Nigeria's serious economic problems, and hand over power to a democratically elected government by the end of 1992. Yet as part of his legacy, some people think of him as a deceitful politician who did not meet the standards he set for himself in the time that he was in power. During this period, human rights abuses, including ethnically based attacks and corruption became widespread, and at one point the Nigerian economy was in the doldrums. In this episode of African Biographics, We cover the rise to power and legacy of General Ibrahim Babaginda, Nigeria's former military ruler. For us to understand the context surrounding Babangida's rise to power, we need to quickly look at a brief history of Nigeria. Nigeria gained independence in 1960, and from then on up until the year 1998, the country had only experienced 10 years of civilian rule, with the rest being under various military regimes. Following the collapse of the First Republic in 1966, the onset of the civil war and subsequent military rule under generals Yakubu Gohon, Motala Mohamed, and Olusegun Obasanjo, Nigeria finally returned to civilian rule in 1979. This was under Shehu Shagari, and the civilian rule only lasted until the end of 1983 when the army again seized control. The current president of Nigeria, General Muhammadu Buhari, became the new military ruler. The reason he stated for taking over power was that corruption and immorality were rife under the leadership of Shehu Shagari and his National Party of Nigeria. Upon taking power, Buhari dissolved or banned all political institutions and reinstated the Supreme Military Council. Buhari's coup was met with widespread disapproval by the Nigerian public, and this wasn't helped either by the fact that the Nigerian economy was in shambles. Under Buhari, there were special tribunals set up to deal with former politicians, a number of whom were sentenced to prison for corruption. There was also the imposition of severe restrictions upon the media, and Buhari became increasingly unpopular because of his appalling handling of the economy, which saw Nigeria being reduced to bartering its oil for imports. And so because of this, the political environment in Nigeria had reached a boiling point. So in the early hours of August 27, 1985, the voice of Major General Joshua Dokonyaro of the Nigerian Army, accompanied by military music, told a bruised and battered nation that power had been seized in a bloodless palace coup from General Muhammadu Buhari by Major General Ibrahim Babangida, who is the main subject of this video. Here's a brief background on Ibrahim Babangida. The man known as Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida was born on August 17, 1941, in Mina, which is now the capital of Niger State, situated in the northern part of the country. He was born to his father Muhammadu Babangida, a Muslim teacher, and his mother Aishatu Babangida, who were both members of the Nupe tribe. Young Ibrahim began high school in 1957 and it was here where he reportedly met a persuasive army recruiting officer and decided to follow his advice and join the military. And so upon graduating from high school in 1962, Ibrahim Babaginda went straight into Nigeria's military training college. As part of his training, Babaginda was sent to a military academy in India and he also had a stint in England. In Nigeria's brutal civil war that broke out in 1967, Ibrahim Babangida served as a commanding officer. In a speech that he gave many years later, Babangida called this civil war as being the most painful national trauma whose emotional scars will continue to haunt Nigeria for years to come. When this brutal civil war had come to an end, Babangida continued to rise through the ranks, and when General Motala Mohamed became the military head of state in 1975, Ibrahim Babangida joined his Supreme Military Council. He was famed for being the military officer who crushed almost single-handedly the coup d'etat of 1976 that resulted in the assassination of General Motala Mohamed. 
Here in Babanginda's heroics, he took back control of the Radio Nigeria station from the main perpetrator of the coup, Lieutenant Colonel Bukasuka Dimka, to prevent him from making further announcements over the airwaves surrounding this coup. Lieutenant Dimka later escaped and was arrested in eastern Nigeria and later publicly executed in May of 1976. A few years later, in 1983, Ibrahim Babaginda played a significant role in the coup d'etat that replaced the civilian government of Shehu Shagari with that of Mahomedou Buhari. This is the same regime that he eventually ousted in August of 1985 to grab power. With Ibrahim Babagida now in charge in Nigeria, he initially took a more conciliatory approach to governance as compared to how Buhari ran the show. So in this regard, Ibrahim Babagida repealed the decree that had strangled press freedom during Buhari's administration and released several journalists from detention. He even brought some of Buhari's harshest critics into his government including Olikoye Ransome Kuti, the brother of the superstar Fela Kuti. Previously, Olikoye Kuti, who was a medical doctor, had led a strike by public health employees protesting the decline of public services under General Buhari. Ibrahim Babaginda also opened an investigation into human rights abuses that had allegedly been perpetrated by the Buhari regime. And in addition, he even reduced or overturned the jail sentences of many of those prosecuted for corruption and other offenses during the time when Buhari was in power. During Buhari's tenure, the military had garnered a reputation for not caring about the opinions of the general public and so to do away with this image, Babaginda encouraged public debate on issues pertaining to the governance of Nigeria. These actions helped paint Babaginda as a benevolent leader whose government no longer wished to suppress contrasting opinions but instead sought to lend an ear to the general populace. Babaginda also took the title of president rather than head of state as an indication that he served as chief executive in the new regime and not just as a military dictator and also to embellish his tenure with legitimacy by using more democratic rhetoric. However, he also faced the same economic problems that Muhammadu Buhari had struggled with and the same domestic dissatisfaction as life in Nigeria had become harder and harder for its citizens. During the 1980s, Nigeria struggled to keep its economy afloat. The country's economy relied heavily on oil production and exports, but unfortunately, during this period, oil prices plummeted and as a result, the economy suffered severely. So one year after Babaginda had seized power, he set in motion a plan to try remedy this dire situation. He declared a national economic emergency, arguing that the economic recession the nation was facing had forced his government to either accept a loan from the IMF and the conditions attached to it, or to put austerity measures on the economy. These measures would entail great sacrifices for Nigeria and its people. So consequently, Babaginda at the behest of the IMF and the World Bank then implemented what were called structural adjustment programs, commonly referred to as SAPs. In a nutshell, these SAPs are the policy change or conditions imposed on developing countries by the IMF and the World Bank for getting new loans or for obtaining lower interest rates on existing loans. So with this in mind, the developing countries, Nigeria in this case, are expected to adopt free market programs and policies such as privatization, deregulation of industries, reduction of trade barriers, devaluation of a currency to stimulate foreign direct investments, and above all, to ensure that there is strict fiscal discipline. And so under these programs for Nigeria, the agricultural sector was deregulated and marketing boards and price controls were abolished. Public enterprises were privatized. The nation's currency, the Naira, was also devalued to aid the competitiveness of the export sector. So Nigeria under Ibrahim Babaginda adopted these structural adjustment programs in 1986. Between 1986 and 1988, when these policies were executed, the Nigerian economy grew as hoped, with the export sector performing significantly well. Nevertheless, the SAPs were not benefiting everyone. While the rural classes and farmers rose from the ashes, the Nigerian middle class and the civil servants dropped back, 
and here's the reason why. As part of the SAPs and in the spirit of tightening the belt, overall government spending on social services was either drastically reduced or completely cut. This meant that people's wages grew much slower and their living standards worsened. In some ways, the SAPs were working, but they were incredibly slow to benefit the common man on the street. So as a result, unemployment rates soared, food prices increased significantly, and numerous fees for education and health services were imposed. The Naira depreciated up to 80% against the United States dollar, and the inflation level barely improved. Inevitably, the high levels of unemployment, job losses, and falling real wages in the public sector led to rioting, public outcry, and demonstrations. Simultaneously, people started noticing the corruption of the government. Nigerians saw that most of them were not benefiting much from these new policies. So this is why many citizens took to the streets to protest the unfairness of the situation. Initially, Ibrahim Bamaginda addressed some of these riots by dissolving part of the Nigeria Labour Congress and temporarily closed universities. But eventually, he gave in and partially reversed the deregulatory initiatives and increasingly returned to earlier inflationary economic policies of the government before the introduction of the SAPs. Following this policy reversal, economic growth ground to a halt. Inflation was also erratic, going up to 50% by the year 1992. And so consequently, more and more people in Nigeria slipped into poverty. Just like his predecessor, Muhammadu Buhari, Ibrahim Babaginda soon acquired a taste for wielding political power to himself and set up a personal dictatorship that was more ruthless than anything Nigeria had previously experienced. His state security service became a law unto itself and gained a notorious reputation for arbitrary arrest, detention, torture and murder. Civilian groups, labor unions, students, professional associations, human rights organizations, and the press were denounced as being extremists and so they were persecuted. Dele Giwa, the outspoken editor of a weekly magazine titled Newswatch, which was widely known for its more hostile view of the Babanginda regime, was assassinated by a parcel bomb. Also, not everyone within the military was happy that General Babanginda was in power. For instance, on December 20, 1985, the government announced the discovery of a plot within the military to overthrow it. Several hundred military personnel were arrested for their involvement in the plot. Ten other military personnel, including the leader of the coup, Major General Maman Vata, were executed in Lagos on March 5 of the same year. In April of 1990, middle-ranking officers led by Major Gideon Orca mounted another coup attempt against Babagida. They attacked Dodan Barracks, which were the headquarters of the ruling military. They also took over Radio Nigeria. This coup eventually collapsed after 10 hours of fighting, and on July 27, 1990, Major Gideon Orca, the coup leader, and 41 other soldiers were executed. Issues to do with religion in Nigeria brought headaches to Ibrahim Babanginda and his government. Unrest in northern Nigeria, mainly Islamic discontent, persuaded Ibrahim to apply for Nigeria to join the organization of Islamic Conference in February of 1986. Continuing clashes between Muslims and Christians led the government to set up an advisory council on religious affairs in April of 1987. But a few years later, Ibrahim Babaginda announced that Nigeria had suspended its membership in the Islamic Conference Organization amid speculation among southern Nigerians that he was trying to make the country Islamic. At the same time, corruption became ubiquitous in Nigeria, with allegations that Babaginda and his military and business associates looted oil revenues, profiteered from drug smuggling, and engaged in systematic commercial fraud on an unprecedented level. Government officials continued to loot the government coffers at the expense of the population, causing many Nigerians to turn to corrupt and illegal activities such as taking bribes, smuggling, armed robbery, and fraudulent schemes in order to make enough money simply to survive. While a few Nigerians became exceedingly wealthy through their corrupt and illicit practices, most people sank into extreme poverty. 
A sharp increase in the price of oil in 1990 as a result of the Gulf crisis brought Nigeria massive oil revenues amounting to around $5 billion. However, much of this money found its way into the hands of the ruling elite. According to the World Bank, an estimated $2 billion in petroleum revenue was diverted in 1990 and 1991 to what was called extra budgetary accounts. And in an official report that came out in 1994, an estimated $12 billion was diverted to extra budgetary accounts between the years 1988 and 1993. When Ibrahim Babanginda came to power, he stated that one of his mandates was to eventually transfer power to a civilian government. So he announced early in 1986 that his plan would come to fruition by 1990, but he later extended the date by two years to allow more time for preparation. As plans were being set in motion towards civilian rule, in October of 1989, Babangida rejected the credentials of all 13 political parties that had emerged to take part in the elections. Instead, the government announced that it would create two parties which all politicians would be allowed to join. These were the National Republican Convention, the NRC, and the Social Democratic Party, the SDP. The long-planned transfer of the federal capital from Lagos to Abuja, a location in central Nigeria, was completed under Ibrahim Babaginda in 1991. The number of states in Nigeria was increased to 30, and the two government-authorized parties, the SDP and the NRC, held countrywide congresses in June of 1991 to select delegates for primary elections. The elections for the Senate and House of Representatives were advanced to July, in which the SDP won a majority of seats in both houses. But the results of the first round of presidential primaries were thrown out in August of 92 due to allegations of corruption and other irregularities. So fresh elections were set for September, but following further setbacks and cancellations, President Babaginda postponed the return to civilian rule until August of 1993. Although the year 1993 began with preparation for elections, it would turn out to be quite a disastrous year for Nigeria. In January, as an apparent move towards instituting a civilian government, a transitional council composed of mainly civilians was set up. At the time, this transitional council was designed to be the final phase leading to a scheduled handover to an elected democratic leader in the 1993 presidential election. Chief Ernest Shonekan was named head of government, although the real power remained with President Babagida. At the end of March 93, the two political parties selected their presidential candidates, and they were Moshud Abiola for the SDP, while the NRC chose Bashir Tofa. The presidential elections were scheduled for June 12, and they were successfully carried out despite a legal attempt to stop them from happening. By June 14, it had become quite apparent that Moshud Abiola was winning by a wide margin. In fact, an organization called the Campaign for Democracy claimed that he had won outright in 19 of the 30 states. However, in a surprising move, President Ibrahim Babangida annulled the results in what he justified as an act to protect Nigeria's legal system and the judiciary from being ridiculed and politicized both nationally and internationally. The annulment of these elections led to widespread protests and political unrest in Mushud Abiola's stronghold of the southwest of Nigeria as many felt Ibrahim Babaginda had ulterior motives and did not want to cede power to Mushud Abiola, a Yoruba businessman. There was outrage internationally as the United States described the annulment as outrageous while Britain cut off aid in protest. In the wake of the civil unrest that ensued in Nigeria and mounting pressure because of the annulment of the election results, Ibrahim Babaginda stood down, handing power over to an interim national government led by Chief Ernest Shonekan. This interim government was supposed to rule until March of 1994. Meanwhile, Moshud Abiola had fled to London, fearing for his life. He would later return to Nigeria to try and claim the presidency, but this did not end well for him. In the interim government, Chief Ernest Shonekan's defense minister was General Sani Abacha, who was generally considered as being Ibrahim Babaginda's right-hand man. 
Sania Bacha refused to recognize the interim government and so on November 17, 1993, he forced Ernest Shonekan to resign and made himself the head of state, marking the beginning of another brutal military regime in Nigeria. As for Ibrahim Babaginda, many years later in the 2000s, he contemplated running for president numerous times but ended up not doing so. Following the election as president of his longtime rival, General Muhammadu Buhari, the man he overthrew in 1985, Ibrahim Babaginda has maintained somewhat of a low profile. Let me know in the comment section below what your thoughts are on the Babaginda presidency and whether he was a dictator. Don't forget to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.